All right, thank you all so much for joining this evening for our board of directors meeting. It's Wednesday, July 21st, 2021. I'm Ashley Stolzman, the chair of Dr. Cog, and I call this meeting to order. I'm gonna turn it over to Melinda so that we can have a roll call and she'll introduce any new members and alternates that we're aware of. Melinda, I turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we do have two new alternates to announce today. Um, Sorry, if you'll give me just one moment. Okay, it looks like we do have um, a new alternate for uh, the city of Westminster, and that is Councillor Lindsay Smith, so welcome. And then we also have a new alternate for the town of Erie, which is trustee Sarah Laughlin. So uh, very nice to have you both and welcome aboard. Um, I do wanna make one quick uh, announcement. Uh, it looks like uh, Linda Montoya, Mayor Linda Montoya, uh, we're not able to bring you over. If you could log out and log back in, um, we'll try and bring you over. Uh, otherwise, we do have you for the record as being in attendance. So with that, I will go ahead and start roll. So please, everyone, just be ready to unmute yourselves and uh, respond. Okay, here we go. Aaron Brockett of Present. Boulder. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Adam Cushing of Brighton. Present. Adam Zarin of the Governor's Office. Allison Coombs of Aurora. Present. Anita Seitz of Westminster. Lindsay Smith of Westminster. And Lindsay, we do see you in attendance. Um, <clears throat> Bill Gipp of Erie. Sarah Laughlin of Illy, Erie. Bill Van Meter of RTD. Present. Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada. I'm Colleen, oh, sorry, thank you. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Present. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Whoa. Matt Jones of Boulder County. <laughs> Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone, George Lance of Greenwood Village, Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village, Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines, Presence, Jacob LeBure of Lakewood, Here, George Teal of Douglas County, Yes, ma'am, Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Present. <laughs> Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. <clears throat> Jim Dale of Golden. Here. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. Here. Jim Kumerly of Lock Bowie. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. Joan Peck of Longmont. Present. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Lisa Jones of Foxfield. Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Joyce Downing of North Glen. Kara Tanucci of Central City. Here. Catherine Whitman of Tacono. Jackie Thomas of Decono. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Christopher Larson of Nederland. Kevin Flynn of Denver. Here. Larry Vidum of Bennett. Here. Linda Montoya, were you able to join us? Okay, if not, uh, I also know that Celeste Arner is in attendance. Um, I'm bringing her over now. So welcome Celeste. Okay, Linda Olson of Inglewood, Cheryl Wink of Inglewood, Margot Ramsden of Bomar, Mike Hillman of Idaho Springs, Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. 
Bud Starker. Good evening. Neil Shaw of Superior. Here. Nicholas Angelo of Lions. Holly Rogan of Lions. Nicholas Williams of Denver. Here. Nicole Frank Here. of Commerce City. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Pamela Grove of Littleton. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Sean Ferre of Morrison. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Toucher of Glendale. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. George Marlin of Clear Creek County. Rebecca White of CDOT. Roy Palmer. Here. Oh, Sorry. thank you, Rebecca. Nope, that's fine. Uh, Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Gail Christie of Columbine Valley. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Here. Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Present. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Tracy Kraft Tharp of Jefferson County. Uh, yes. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. William Lindstedt of Broomfield. Present. Wynn Shaw of Lone Tree. Present. Fantastic. And if there's anyone I missed, if you want to raise your hand now. All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Oh, uh, Tim Howard. All right. And with that, Madam Chair, I will hand it back. Oh, and Adam Cushing of Brighton. Um, and with that, I will hand it back to you, Madam Chair, with a quorum present. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to let folks know, um, a few folks called in that they couldn't make it. Um, and Sally Daigle wanted me to let you all know, uh, Director Sally Daigle wanted me to let you all know that, um, that some folks are working on the maps that were released for different cities and some cities were split and things like that in the con congressional district. So that conflict has made some people have to miss this evening. And um, additionally, Sally let me know that um, if you get kicked off and you rejoin the meeting, you'll join in the attendee side. And um, so I just wanna encourage everyone, if that happens to you, to please just raise your hand over the, in the attendee side and I'll take a peek over there from time to time and we can move you back over to um, the uh, board side. So if that happens to anyone, just please let us know by raising your hand and you can click that at the bottom of your screen. And so with that, I would ask for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved, Bud Starker. Thank oh, you. So I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. That's, you're just fine. Thanks, Director Starker and um, Director Shaw. I second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carries. The agenda is approved. And that takes us to the report of the chair this evening. I do have some um, brief remarks that I made slides for to help me stay on track. Um, so I'll share my screen. And I uh, just want to start by saying I talked to one of my mentors earlier in the day. Um, and she um, talked to me about, because um, I was a little nervous about making this presentation to you all. And she talked about being honest and authentic and just making sure that people know that I'm presenting from a place of continuous improvement and try to be um, transparent and authentic with the organization. And so I hope my remarks come across that way. And um, if you have any questions, please email me. These are my remarks. They're not staff's remarks or anything else. So as the chair um, of Dr. Cog, I, I from time to time am asked to do things to represent the board. And one of the things that I'm currently doing is serving on the SAC. 
So at the staff meeting last week, the CDOT uh, staff brought forward project allocation for 3B funding of the 10 year plan. And let me just refresh everybody what that, what I mean by all that. So you might remember the region, uh, the, the plan was broken down by regions and the majority of Dr. Cog is in region one and part of it's in region four. And there were identified projects for years one through four funding and then years five through 10 funding. And we are in year three. Earlier in the year, we brought to the board what was funded in year three, but we were fortunate enough to get some more funding through stimulus. So the staff have brought forward some additional funding recommendations. So this was the original one through four list from region one from the 10 year plan. So <clears throat> at the meeting a couple of weeks ago, um, we were sent some information uh, the Thursday night before a Friday meeting on what projects to fund for region one. So almost every project in years one through four is completed um, for CDOT's 10 year plan, except for in our region. So the CDOT year 3B package actually suggests moving some projects from years five through 10 up into this 3B list. And actually, if you look back to earlier in the year, there were projects that were moved from the year five to 10 list into the year three list as well. So like an example of that is noise wall maintenance. So earlier in the year, there was a project listed that was a $10 million project for noise wall maintenance. And we moved $10 million uh, into that project. Maybe some of us thought that would complete the project because that was the amount that was listed. <clears throat> but in the new update, uh, additional money from years five through 10 is moving into this year 3B section. And additional money is going to noise wall maintenance and another, a number of other projects. So <clears throat> I wanna communicate to you all Region one has about 115 million uh, in proposed projects from years five to 10 that have moved forward into years three and 3B. However, our region still has about 184 million in projects in years one through four on the list that are unfunded. And I say at least because the 10 year list doesn't list full project costs or even the CDOT contributions. There's always partner match. And there are even, if you look back historically, each project has costed much more than is listed in the 10 year plan. So the types of projects that are still remaining in years one through four are projects like I-270, Floyd Hill, I-70, West Metro Bridges, the Castle Rock Mobility Hub, and the bus tank facility in the Denver area. So those are some of the things that are still remaining. So because we were presented with this information at a very late hour, we weren't able to bring it to the board to ask, should these other projects from years five through 10 move ahead of these projects that are in years one through four? and it wasn't clear what criteria were moved, uh, used to move the projects. So you might remember, like we have a number of outstanding issues in region one. You probably remember this Denver seven story where concrete chunks are literally falling from bridges. We have holes in our bridges, we have things like that. So I was hoping to have a collaborative discussion that stack around what criteria were used, what partner projects would wanna be funded. And I don't expect everyone to read this and I'm not gonna read through this entire list, but these are the types of questions I expected the board members would ask me to be accountable to, to reporting back to you on like, um, will this list help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions, these movements, are these projects shovel ready? Um, we're moving Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel forward with $50 million. Does that put the rest of the Eisenhower Johnson Memorial repairs ahead of the rest of our list? Because there's still a hundred million in additional repairs. Uh, should that really be funded with stimulus funding or should the new bridge and tunnel uh, enterprise pay for that since we created a tunnel enterprise? So I, I anticipated a number of questions from the board and asked that the Transportation Commission would consider delaying their decision one month so we'd be able to bring these projects back to you all and get input and understand the answers to some of these questions. However, and so I sent a letter to Transportation Commission um, and so you all were sent a copy of that letter and you should have it in your email so you can review it. And um, despite our letter and my best effort, the Transportation Commission chose to move forward with the funding of the projects in year 3B. So I did just wanna point out that there were some recommendations in the letter that I think would make a significant improvement going forward. And that's um, the spirit in which I'm giving this presentation. <laughs> so for future decisions, it seems that communicating the criteria and the process that's used to move projects around in the 10 year list is an important uh, requirement that we should build in enough time so we can consult with and receive input from our TPRs, that we should update the entire strategic plan uh, pipeline to include total and estimated construction costs, 
that when we're presenting our funding allocations, CDOT should include the entire 10-year funding plan to document funding changes. So just so you guys know, finding that information to share with all of you was a total chore. It took me hours and hours and hours of pouring through various documents because it's not all located in one place. And so you might say, well, obviously it's all in one place. Ashley, you just showed us it. It's not. This In this PowerPoint presentation is the only place it's in one place. And document and share um, project status, phasing, and funding needs for every project. Because that would help us understand, you know, maybe something's in design so it can't accelerate. But do we know we have funding available for it in the next year? Or is there a funding gap um, that remains? And that would help um, decision makers be able to, to determine those things going forward. So I wanted to provide you that update. And <clears throat> feel free to email your, your transportation commissioners for your district and your representatives and share with them your feelings about that. The next update I wanted to talk to you about is around greenhouse gas rulemaking. So as the Dr. Cog board chair, I've been asked to participate in these uh, kitchen cabinet meetings around uh, greenhouse gas emissions and transportation. And you'll remember back in January, we got the greenhouse gas pollution reduction roadmap. And it really is a call to action um, because we have this climate crisis in front of us and we need to take drastic steps to be able to meet these targets for 2050, which is 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And so the area I'll focus on from that roadmap really is the transportation sector. And you'll see even by 2030, the transportation sector is hoping to see significant reductions in uh, million metric tons of carbon emission equivalents, uh, carbon dioxide emission equivalents. And if you haven't read the plan, you should. It's, it's an informative document. So you'll also remember earlier in the year on the reporting on the plan that you know we're way behind, that um, how far will the state go? Will there be regulatory backing to back up this plan? Like how will we meet these targets because we're not on course for 2025 and we're not on course for 2030. Um, and so um, CDOT staff have been working really hard to run different scenarios and to come up with a path forward just on the transportation piece. And even uh, more specifically, the conversations I've been part of are really only about light duty vehicles and maybe some freight and trucking. It doesn't include the entire transportation sector. So CDOT staff have built on the scenario modeling that Dr. Cog's staff showed um, Dr. Cog. So it was really directional modeling that said, what if we did all of these aggressive things? What would happen? So what if we doubled transit? What if we halved transit prices? What if we reduced trips, uh, by non-work trips by 40% for students and 10% for everyone else? What if we had significant densification of the region so that we had people and jobs by transit? So this is what I would call, what when Dr. Cogstaff was doing it, would be what I would call directional modeling so that we could see you know, if we had these, if we had unlimited funding and we had no constraints, what would happen? So there's sort of what if scenarios. And so we've seen some data now. Um, so you can see in the top line, the roadmap information. And again, these are my best efforts of pulling together information from a variety of sources. So in the top line, you'll see from the greenhouse gas emissions roadmap, uh, there are some targets for the entire transportation sector in that uh, million metric ton carbon uh, dioxide equivalents reductions. And then there's this land scenario that I just talked about with the doubling of transit and the reduction in fares and densification and reduction in trips and then player trip reduction, all those things that we wanna think about. And you can see that in the second line here. And then the third line that I've shown is just EV adoption alone. And the fourth is the number of EVs that are assumed in that adoption line. So what I wanted to point out to the board is that you can see that the strongest signal is certainly from EV adoption alone, that if we want to see big changes in emissions from the light duty vehicle sector, the biggest gains are going to be from people stopping driving combustion vehicles, combustion uh, engine vehicles, and switching to um, non-carbon emitting types of engines. Um, you can also see that even with those uncon fiscally unconstrained and regulatory unconstrained scenarios, that the returns on those scenarios really is diminishing with increasing EVs, uh, because you see that fuel switch over there. So the reason I bring this to your attention is most of the discussion that I've sat in and listened to is around rulemaking on this line here, which is the theoretical aggressive scenario. 
and most of it is focused in on our Denver metro area. And so I just want to bring attention to this so people can start to consider things and get ready for next month's board meeting. So there are financial and regular con regulatory constraints. There are alternative actions that might yield more significant reductions. Like, for example, um, what if we did a big program to incentivize electric vehicle switching at the same magnitude of uh, cost to one of these other programs? How would that stack up from an emissions reduction standpoint? Um, Part of my concern and why I bring this forward and trying to get everyone thinking about it is that there's been discussion around penalties to our transportation funding in our region to try to meet us to make us meet these targets. So I'm concerned that further penalizing transportation funding will actually only make it harder for us to reach these targets and that we're focusing in on maybe the noise and not the signal in the data. So while I think this is tremendously important. Uh, and we need to all focus in on this and work together. I'm not necessarily convinced that we're focused uh, in a collaborative or a listening type of way. So questions I want people to think about before the next meeting um, and, and bring your own and we should challenge each other and we should have a great dialogue, but how much additional funding would we need um, to give to RTD to be able to double their service? How much additional funding would they need to be able to have free fare? And maybe we should do that, uh, but I think we need to understand the cost of that and then how that cost compares to alternatives that we could use that funding on. Um, would communities be mandated with growth boundaries to in achieve the densification that's been outlined and would communities buy into that? Would the state be willing to back that kind of a program? Would employer or other types of mandates be backed and enforced by the state or would those types of mandates be expected to be enforced at our level? So those are just things I'm posing as questions to get people thinking. Um, and again, these are my thoughts, not anyone else's. I'm not trying to make anyone um, you know, feel bad. I really am trying to get people to think about this and have an open dialogue moving forward. But I wanna sort of raise the alarm and ask people to, in the words of Vanilla Ice, stop, collaborate and listen. <laughs> I mean, I don't feel that we're necessarily listening or collaborating at this point. I think it's a great time to just put a pause and do a charrette with one another and really talk about what types of things we could do. And you know, this is an urgent climate crisis. And so we don't have the luxury of having good intentions to put in place programs that are really well-meaning. We need to actually look at the data that we have and the modeling we have available so that we put in programs that actually work and we can do good work together in the short run because this is too important to miss on. And so I think that comes from collaboration and honest dialogue. So I hope I've not come off as harsh or said things that totally made everyone jump out of their skin this evening, but I think honest dialogue is a really critical part of charting a course to success. And so action alert, there is a uh, discussion next month at our work session around this topic and at our board meeting on this topic to take action. So please talk with your councils, talk with your environmental groups, talk with your transportation groups, talk with your employers and, and come ready to have a good discussion in, in the next month's board meeting. So thank you all. That is my report and I'll turn it over to the Finance and Budget Committee for a report from them. Thank you, Madam Chair. This report includes information from both our June 24th meeting, which was rescheduled to accommodate the regular meeting schedule of the ACA and uh, tonight's meeting. Uh, for the June 24th meeting, Finance and Budget uh, authorized the executive director to issue contracts with AAA transportation service providers for up to $780,000 and in-home voucher programs up to $500,000 for the year beginning July 1st, 2021. Uh, F&B authorized the executive director to contract with Nimble Science for a mobile fall prevention program not to exceed $363,000 for six months starting July 1st, 2021, with an option to extend an additional six months. From this evening's meeting, we authorize the executive director to execute a contract amending uh, amendment with Right Amigos for additional functionality for the mywaytogo.org site. Also to enter an agreement with the FTA to further allocate 
$327,402 in ARPA funds to benefit the region and to further allocate $327,397 of CRISA funds to benefit the region. We also authorize the executive director to execute a contract with the Colorado Refugee Services Program not to exceed $115,000 for the term October 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2022 to support uh, Dr. Cog's Elder Refugee Services Program. Madam Chair, that is my report. Thank you, Director Shaw. And that takes us to the report from the Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks also to the Performance and Engagement Committee who met on Wednesday, July 7th. I appreciate all the uh, committee members that were able to be a, a part of that. We had two great discussions. One was on the board director collaboration assessment. Uh, those of you that have been on the board any length of time have, have experienced that process of, of that uh, assessment tool that helped to look at how the board is functioning and what your thoughts are about the board. We've got five years of longitudinal data, so we're looking forward to doing that again this year uh, with, with a few tweaks. Uh, we will be discussing that assessment at one of our August, uh, either the, the workshop or the uh, board meeting, just so you all get a little bit more information before that appears in your inbox. And then the second item that we discussed was an update on the uh, board workshop coming up uh, in August, August 27th through 28th, you will be receiving in the next couple of days the draft agenda along with a link to RSVP and also information on our hotel room block in case you want to stay downtown close to the workshop uh, as opposed to, to driving back and forth. Uh, and you'll be getting all of that soon. I will point out that the draft is subject to some change. There are still some moving parts, but the agenda is hopefully a very, uh, very good workshop for the group that will bring us all together and allow us to dig in uh, depth to some, some important topics. And that is my report. Thank you, Director Conklin. And that takes us to our report of our Executive Director, Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Director Conklin, for your report on the board workshop, um, I won't belabor the point, but I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in person for that event. Um, so hopefully um, things are trending in that direction so we can see everybody and we're excited. So there will be an RSVP button on that email that's sent out. So please, um, please sign up. Um, we're looking forward again to seeing you guys. Um, I just have a couple other items I might, might mention. Uh, first, Dr. Cog was recently certified by the Age Friendly Institute as an age friendly employer. Um, they were, this is a pretty recent uh, certification. We're the third, I believe, to receive this designation. And it was, it was a structured evaluation of Dr. Cog's human resources and management policies. Um, related to um, best known practices model. Um, so they looked at certain things like general commitment and workforce policies, uh, candidate recruitment, management style and practices, training and development, those types of things. So we we're very excited and, and obviously we'll utilize this in our, our future recruitment. Um, the last thing I might mention is that if you've been following our Twitter feed, you might've noticed that there are two nature-based collaboratives in our region Metro Denver and Nature Alliance and NOCO Places 2050. Um, uh, these, are, these are two partners that we've done, done quite a bit of work with through the years. Um, we're recently awarded grants to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife and, and Great Outdoors Colorado to participate in the Colorado Outdoors Regional Partnership Initiative. Um, we're excited to continue to work with these folks on, on this initiative. And uh, it's a two year process and we're we're ready, willing, and able to assist wherever we can. If you have any questions or, or want some additional information about that, please reach out to, uh, to Brad Calvert. That's my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. And that takes us to our public comment period. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. I would request that there's no public comment on issues for which a prior public Prior public hearing has been held before the board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Are there any folks who would care to comment? Our first speaker this evening is Randall Loeb. Good evening, Randall. It'll take us just a second. Uh, you may need to unmute. There you go. I did it. 
Uh, good evening, and, and as usual, thank you for the privilege of addressing um, the leadership of this region. Um, we're working in Denver on a um, basic living income. And uh, I noticed you were talking about the possibilities of um, reduced uh, fares on transit. Uh, we need to make it possible for all of the people who live in our region, in all of the communities, to have an, a basic living income. And I would urge you all to consider doing the same thing that Denver's doing um, to help develop a method for us to make sure that people are safe, that they have housing, that they are able to get around, that they have adequate health care, uh, because health care, as always, uh, it's, as it's being said, is, um, is a, uh, a right of, of housing too. And um, to make it possible for us to change our perspective about every person who lives within our region to have the same opportunities to develop and promote the lives of their children and their um, relationship to the community as a whole. I think that this in this time with the going away of the um, help for people who are um, in rental situations um, and the issue of the possibility of increasing numbers of people who are homeless makes it imperative for us to find a way for basic living income. And as an elder, an older person over 70 in this community, I think it's incredibly important that we also remember that today they announced that the lifespan of average individuals in our society re reduced by three years and that that has not happened at such a large rate since World War II. And of course, some of it can be related to the pandemic, but also it says in the same report that people of color are more likely than to have a, a shorter lifespan. And we must make it possible to protect all of our citizens, regardless of what they're doing or where they come from. So thank you for allowing me to address you briefly, but those are my thoughts at this moment. Thank you, Mr. Loeb. Are there any other members of the public that would care to comment this evening? All right, seeing none, thank you. That takes us back over to our agenda item. And so that takes us to our consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Um, Mayor Starker, Director Starker. Uh, so moved. Thank you. And is there a second, Director Coombs? Second. Thank you. Any discussion of the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. And so our first action item this evening is the discussion of the Employee Traffic Reduction Program. And so you'll find actually that there was a um, amendment to this that was sent out to the board. So you'll want to look and it's also posted on the link as an addendum to the packet because there was late breaking news from Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. So actually, if you're following along on the packet, it was attachment C, but now you'll find it as the new link. And um, I think we're going to get some even new information here at the meeting um, real time. So I'll turn it over to Steve Erickson, our Director of Communications and Marketing to tell us where we were and where we are now. Steve, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I've had a very interesting week. I'll just start with that. Um, I'm Steve Erickson, Communications and Marketing Director at Dr. Cog. And you know, I want to first apologize for the moving target this agenda item represents. Um, as, you know, to recap, uh, Wednesday of last week as part of the board packet, we included the agenda memo presentation linked to some additional info based on what we knew at the time uh, regarding CDPHE's proposed Rule 22 amendment. Yesterday, as, as, as Chair Stolzman indicated, based on a written statement uh, we received on Monday from CDPHE, we shared a late breaking update suggesting that significant change to the proposed amendment. And it was still our intention to have a discussion tonight about that and perhaps get some direction. And now, I mean, literally uh, five minutes before this board meeting, I kind of knew this was coming earlier today, but uh, we received a notice from the Assistant Attorney uh, General that basically the entire proposed ETRP amendment or APCD's support of that is being withdrawn. Uh, and that uh, I'm happy to share that uh, with, with the board. 
uh, again, just came in, but uh, you know, it goes on to indicate we'll continue with the voluntary efforts uh, that are already a part of this region through our Way to Go program. So really at this point in time, I'm disappointed. Um, we won't get to have that spirited discussion about this um, and it doesn't really make any uh, sense at all to even review uh, what was sent out as sort of part two of, of this as it's really no longer pertinent. Uh, this particular action, which was specifically identified in the state's greenhouse gas pollution reduction roadmap and a part of uh, meeting the targets laid out in House Bill 19-1261 is really for all intents and purposes uh, stalled. Uh, we'll continue to monitor any developments and keep the board apprised as more information becomes available. And certainly our, our way to go partnership uh, and program will continue our efforts in the region to work with employers and commuters alike uh, to encourage better ways to get around. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions or just hand it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Director Erickson. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, but can you tell us, um, so this was you know, sort of quickly brought upon us and then quickly taken away is there a chance that this quickly comes back in the next month without, I mean, is there a chance that we'll need to have given some input on what was? I, I really don't think so. I mean, my understanding, and again, I'm, I'm happy to share uh, the notice that just came in was, you know, that if, if, if APCD is withdrawing their proposal, that, that draft proposal uh, for this amendment, it is, again, I think pretty much dead in the water. All right, thank you. And so we'll take questions from folks and any questions are um, open, including questions about what, we, what we're talking about if people need more background information. Director Brown. Uh, actually, you mostly asked my question. It sounds like it's 100% uh, dead in the water and so there's nothing for us to give input on. Um, so uh, anyway, Steve, thanks for, for tracking it closely. If you could send along that notice uh, through email just so that we have a copy of it. I appreciate it. Um, it is disappointing that, that this effort is not going anywhere. It plays well to Dr. Cog's strengths. And I, I think we could, have, we could have helped a lot with that. Thank you, yes, th thank you Director Brockett. And I'll definitely, uh, we'll get that out uh, even tonight. I've, I've got a copy, again, literally came in five minutes before this meeting, even though I had that heads up. Um, we were really waiting to, to see it be official. Thanks, thanks Director Brockett. Director Coombs? Um, yeah, so in light of the earlier comments regarding the significant need for transportation based uh, carbon reduction, is there any idea of anything <laughs> or is maybe our next work session and kind of the discussions we want to have there the best place to talk about that? Because that's honestly really concerning to me. Like Aurora had comments, but um, just to scrap the whole thing, I think is very concerning around those goals to significantly reduce carbon emissions. Director Erickson? Yeah, you know, happy to have um, uh, discussions at a board work session. Again, uh, as I understand it in, in this written notice, uh, there may be some opportunity uh, perhaps to bolster the voluntary efforts in the region. Uh, even the, um, the statement that was issued on, on Monday, I think uh, hinted at some incentives uh, perhaps. So I, I had several conversations with folks at CDPHE. Uh, we will be debriefing and uh, licking our wounds and figuring out what next. Um, but, but certainly if there's an opportunity for us to sort of up the efforts in, in terms of the way to go program and partnership and what we're already doing with employers and commuters today, we'll certainly, you know, we'll want to explore that. Um, Director Coombs, does that answer your question? I think that, I think that the comments, the work session is really targeted on the transportation um, GHG rulemaking, which is actually different than this air quality control commission rulemaking was. Um, so I don't know that this will exactly fit into it, but maybe in the broader context, it will. Executive Director X, does that seem right to you? He's not. It, yes. Excellent. Uh, Director Teal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Steve, I wonder if even briefly, you could give us an idea. What was the logic outlined in the AG's communication? 
I'm sorry, I've got, we've got the planning people here. I'm in the office. Can you repeat that, George? I'm, I'm so sorry. I wonder if you could share with us, even if briefly, the logic uh, detailed in the Attorney General's communication. Uh, uh, the, one, the one today? Yes, just one minute. That's okay. <laughs> sorry. Yes, um, yes, please, sir. Yes, let me, uh, let me just pull that up really quickly, Director Teal. I mean, uh, understanding, of course, that, yeah, yeah, you know, you've made a commitment to share with the board, but if you could just kind of give us a, a sneak yeah. peek, if you will. Yeah, this, this may be the most um, uh, maybe uh, uh, relevant paragraph. Uh, after extensive outreach and engagement with a diverse range of stakeholders, the division now withdraws its support and proposals for a formal ETRP rule, and instead we'll focus on opportunities presented through a voluntary program. Um, yeah, it doesn't, other than that, and that was uh, Director Teal in large part what, um, uh, you know, was included in that statement uh, that we got on on Monday as well, as, as you might guess, um, you know, we are uh, a party uh, to this hearing. Dr. Cog is a party to this hearing along with, oh gosh, roughly 60 other organizations. And certainly some of the feedback from uh, industry groups was, you know, that that any regulation or or rule, um, you know, was was perhaps seen as onerous, and the and the timing maybe not great coming out of out of COVID. Um, but there certainly were a lot of voices uh, on the other side. And as I shared at Finance and Budget earlier, uh, you know, we we've done our best in the Way to Go program to sort of position. Um, ourselves to be able to support this in a way to where it would not have been, in my mind, a heavy lift for, for employers. So, um, but that's about, that's about all that's included in, in, in that uh, letter, uh, Director Teal, sorry. All right, thanks, Steve. I uh, look forward to seeing it uh, in the inbox. Thank you, Director Teal. Director Peck. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very disappointed in this, uh, that they're not going to support this rulemaking as we were going to use this as support for in our advanced Longmont 2.0 connectivity to when we meet with businesses to get them on board for reducing GHG and supporting it. So uh, also um, not supporting this rulemaking uh, kind of underscores uh, Chair Stoltzman's call to action basically on how do we move forward that good intentions really don't get us anywhere. We need to put actionable items on the on the table and really follow through. So uh, hopefully we can do that at the next work session and become more, become stronger in an actionable item. So thanks. Any other questions on this topic this evening? All right. Seeing them, we will um, look forward to seeing that email, um, Director Erickson, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Next on our action item list is the discussion of the FY 2022-2023 Unified Planning Work Program for the Denver region. And I'm going to turn it over uh, to Ron Papsdorf to introduce the speaker this evening. Director Papsdorf. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, members of the board, Ron Papsdorf. Um, I'm the Director of Transportation Planning and Operations here at Dr. Cog. Um, this is, um, as the agenda item states, um, a consideration of adoption of our fiscal year 2022 to 2023 Unified Planning Work Program. And I'm, I'll, I'll hand that off to Josh, but um, Josh is new, relatively new to the organization. He hasn't presented to the board, so I wanted to take this opportunity to just introduce him to everyone. Some of you have probably had a chance to meet him and Regional trans sub regional transportation forums um, around the region. Uh, Josh joined us back in November last year. Um, I actually have not even had the pleasure of meeting Josh in person, face to face, since he joined the organization during the pandemic. Uh, looking forward to that. But he has already just been a terrific asset to the organization. Um, he jumped right in and uh, helped with, uh, has helped with tip issues, uh, tip waitlist issues, the unified planning work program. He helped out um, at the at the end stages of the regional transportation plan. He's even helping out on our advanced mobility partnership um, effort. So just really has been a great asset. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to introduce um, Josh to all of you this evening before he uh, speaks to the unified planning work program item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Josh. Please welcome to uh, Dr. Cog, first of all. And we look forward to hearing from you, those of us who haven't yet. 
and um, please take it away when you're ready. Great, thank you, Chair Stolzman, and thank you, Ron, for the introduction. Um, before I get uh, too into the presentation, I do just want to make one quick note. Uh, we did send out the draft Unified Planning Work Program for public comment by eBlast. That public comment period actually closed at 5 p.m. today. Um, so uh, we did receive three comments and I, we emailed them out to board members shortly after five, um, but I just wanted to provide that uh, note right up front, just in case board members may not have seen the email come through that you can uh, check that in your inbox and review those if you so desire. So going into the presentation, maybe. <laughs> Um, the uh, Unified Planning Work Program is a list of all of the transportation planning activities to be conducted in our region over a two year period. Uh, this version of the document does cover federal fiscal years 2022 and 23. We uh, prepare this in line with federal regulations um, that require us to show how federal transportation planning funds are being spent in the region but we also use it as an agency to uh, budget out staff time and agency resources to the various activities that we conduct. So as we're putting it together, there's several things that we need to keep in mind. There are, of course, uh, certain work products that we must produce as the MPO for the region. These include the RTP, the TIP, the air quality conformity modeling for both of those documents, uh, just as a few examples. There are also a set of 10 federal transportation planning factors, which are kind of issue areas that direct us uh, in what areas we need to be doing work. Um, the document does list out all 10 of those and lists which activities are relevant uh, to each one of them to show that we are meeting our obligations there. But also on a regional level, um, the Metro Vision Plan and the new MVRTP really provide the vision for where we want to be going as a region and we want to ensure that the activities and tasks contained within this document are uh, relevant to that region are helping us to meet our objectives and goals. So within this specific document, one of the first sections is an accomplishment section. It just goes over what's occurred over the past two year period um, in the previous UPWP. So just a few examples are pulled out on this screen, but we definitely kind of pat ourselves on the back a little bit in this section, but also we want to share with all of you and with the general public all of the work that we have been uh, doing over the past two years, even in kind of a difficult circumstance uh, with being virtual for, for most of this period. Uh, we've still produced some, some significant documents, uh, had some uh, pretty in-depth engagement with the public in the development of some of these. Um, so we want to be sure that we're sharing that out. In terms of the actual structure of the activities and tasks that are listed in the document, uh, this has not changed from previous versions. There are seven uh, major objectives. Within each objective, there's a list of several activities, which are kind of uh, specific topic areas where there will be at work. And then within each activity is a bullet point list of tasks that will be completed, as well as any discrete deliverables that will be produced. So what that looks like is now on your screen, there are uh, seven objectives, as I mentioned, um, and you can see some uh, brief descriptions of what's contained within each one. I won't go through all of them. I'll just point out, we did go through a, an activity to try to uh, streamline this a little bit, um, move activities between objectives a little bit to make it a little bit more intuitive, but overall there's been no significant change. Um, the structure's very similar to what we've had in the past. So if you are familiar with it, if you're looking for a specific activity, it should be relatively easy to find. Uh, just a few highlights of some of the activities and tasks that are included in the new draft UPWP. Um, and this is by no means everything. These are just a few of the major tasks that we wanted to pull out. Um, those include the new 24 to 27 transportation improvement program and its associated call for projects. Um, a lot of implementation work around the new 2050 MVRTP. Um, related to that is some continued implementation and some updates around some of our other key plans 
So that includes our regional vision zero plan. We're looking at a potential update to the high injury network as new crash data comes out, as well as the continued work of the regional vision zero working group. Um, continued uh, implementation of the active transportation plan as we roll out the complete streets toolkit um, and then continued work around mobility choice blueprint with the advanced mobility partnership as well as the micro mobility working group. Some new activities are Dr. Cog led corridor and community based transportation planning. So we'll have more info on that as they're rolled out in a few months, um, but very excited to see uh, what those turn into as they are developed. And then of course, continued uh, development of the Denver Regional Aerial Photography Project or DRAP, as well as some of its associated data projects, the planimetric and land cover projects. We know a lot of our local agencies rely on that data. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that board members may have. Otherwise there is a draft motion in front of you for your consideration and thank you for your time. Thank you, Director. Any, um, any directors of the board have any questions this evening on our Unified Planning Work Program? Or would someone like to make a motion to frame the discussion? Director Peck? I move to approve the draft fiscal year 2022 through fiscal year 2023 Unified Planning Work Program. Thank you, is there a second? Director Flynn? I will second that motion, thank you. Thank you, Director Flynn. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion of the motion this evening? All right, seeing none, if you'll unmute yourself, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone, the motion carries. Thanks so much, Josh, for that great presentation. That takes us to our next agenda item this evening, which is the discussion of the transportation improvement project, second year delays. You'll find it as attachment E in your packet and Todd Cottrell, our senior transportation planner from transportation planning and operations will take us through it. Good evening, Todd. Good evening and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so if you recall, uh, normally this is a conversation that staff would have with you in each October um, in accordance to the adopted TIP policy. Uh, however, the adopted TIP policy, uh, which is the current uh, and covers uh, federal fiscal years 20 through 23, uh, that project delays policy did change for the second year delays. Uh, and so again, this is a policy that covers any projects that Dr. Cog has allocated funds to um, from FY20 through 23. So the adopted policy states that if a project phase um, is not initiated by October 1st, um, that project phase becomes delayed. And if that delayed project phase is still not initiated as of the following July 1st, that first year delayed phase becomes delayed for a second year. Um, the new policy does not allow the project sponsors to appeal the second year delay. Uh, it states that if the delay is determined to be caused by the project sponsor itself, then the unreimbursed uh, funding that Dr. Cog allocated to the project for that delayed phase is to be returned back to Dr. Cog for reprogramming. The sponsor may still continue their project, but the Dr. Cog allocated funds will not uh, be available for that sponsor to, to use. Uh, the policy states um, and continues that if it's determined a second year delay is the fault of another agency, so another agency could be CDOT or RTD, or it could even be maybe railroads or a, a utility company, or if it happens to be an outside factor, um, which in this last year, COVID is a great example of that. Um, this could also include maybe natural disasters, maybe flooding, or even changes in law or changes in, in policy and practices. That future course of action and or penalty is to be determined by the board. So your action may range anywhere from the loss of funding for that delayed phase, um, to an extension of time to initiate that delayed project. Um, attachment one in your packet outlines the current project delays policy. So Dr. Cog staff has reviewed the status of all the project phases that received a first year delayed uh, phase last year um, for 2020. And then after confirming with CDOT, RTD and the project sponsor staff, it has been determined that two projects continue to have delayed project phases 
um, that were not initiated by this, this last July 1st. So those two projects receiving a second year delay include uh, a project called Safe Stops through Sheraton, which is sponsored by the city of Sheraton. Um, the project phase that is delayed for a second year is construction, meaning the project would have to be advertised for construction to, to no longer be delayed. Um, according to Sheraton, um, they report the entire project continues to be delayed due to COVID-19. Um, they do have limited staff. And of course, being a smaller city, um, their delay within the beginning of the project with the IGA process um, and design early on um, just continued throughout the entire project. Um, the staff recommendation, which is also backed by CDOT, is to allow the project to continue with project advertisement no later than September 30th. The second project that is receiving a second year delay um, is a project sponsored by the city of Westminster uh, and is the US 36 and Church Ranch Station Multimodal Access Improvements. Um, this project phase that is delayed is also construction, meaning the project would have to be advertised to no longer be delayed. Um, they report that the, that the project was delayed due to a few items, um, these include the new CDOT DocuSign IGA process from last year, um, some permitting from RTD, and of course, COVID-19. Um, the staff recommendation is similar to the last project. Uh, this is also backed up by CDOT, and it's to allow the, the project to continue with project advertisement no later than September 30th. Uh, so attachments two and three in your packet contain letters from each sponsor which may contain uh, additional information. Um, so unless you have any questions or further comments, the motion before you is to approve a course of action on both the FY20 um, TIP funded second year project delays, uh, which again, as I stated earlier, is to allow both projects to continue towards project advertisement uh, to happen no later than September 30th of this year. Thank you, Director Cottrell. Are there any questions from members? or would someone like to frame a, a motion? Um, and we can continue debate after a motion's on the table. That's not a problem. Director Coombs. Uh, move to approve this item. Thank you, Director Coombs. Is there a second? Second by Larry Vidham. Thank you, Director Vidham. Is there discussion of this matter? <clears throat> this evening. I am not seeing any. Uh, and so I lost my place in the agenda, but th there was a motion on the table uh, to approve the transportation improvement project second year delays. And seeing no further debate, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. So that takes us to our informational briefings. And Todd Cottrell is going to take us through our informational briefing this evening. Um, and as I said before, he's our senior transportation planner. And this briefing will be on our uh, 2020 to 2023 transportation improvement program dual model. This is our process overview for folks. Thanks, Thank Todd. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, so um, this evening's uh, presentation is essentially twofold. Um, as Josh mentioned a couple presentations ago, um, we have kicked off development of our 24 to 27 tip. Um, we started this back in April with our transportation advisory committee. Um, it, but at the same time, as we begin development of a new tip, uh, we certainly wanted to go back and uh, for all of those board members, whether you are uh, brand new to the board or that you've been around, uh, including through the dual model process is just to give everyone a refresher on what exactly the dual model process is. So this is a process that was brand new to Dr. Cog, a brand new uh, TIP project selection process that started with the, last, the previous TIP um, covering 20 through 23. Um, and if you really look at this um, as a process development, it took little over four years to develop 140 meetings, uh, both on the, on, the, on the technical and on the policy side. So there was a lot of involvement, a lot of discussions that led to the policy that, not, that we use now. The best way to really describe the dual model process 
is to compare it to how it kind of used to be. And we, we use the comparison of centralized versus decentralized. And by centralized, we simply mean where previous to 2023 20, uh, tip cycle, um, Dr. Cog would issue the call for projects. Um, those applications would come back to Dr. Cog's staff. We would score them. We would make a recommendation to um, the individual committees and eventually the board. With the decentralized process, though Dr. Cog's staff does have a little bit of hand within the regional share process, and we'll get to that here in a little bit, but most of the process really works with um, the transportation forums, which were new to this process. And it really uh, further involves all the parties that were involved, that are out there um, that submitted projects and to really get everyone involved. So we've really moved that process from an internal Dr. Cog only process out to everyone that is involved. The foundational elements um, really include the four items you see on your screen, um, the set-asides, um, the transportation forums, um, the funding splits, which really are the regional share and the sub-regional share, and of course, the tip focus areas. Um, the last three I'll go through here in a few minutes, but the set-asides um, really outline something that has been a part of the Dr. Cog tip process for the last 20 years plus. Um, these where as we take uh, funding off the top um, of the allocations that we get for each tip cycle and we put that towards um, individualized a little bit more specialized um, programs where they can each have their own individual call for projects um, and are really able to gather um, you know more specialized projects through that information so first uh, regarding transportation forums um, again, I, these were created as part of the brand new pro, uh, process, and it really contains the individual counties and all of the incorporated areas within, where each member of the forum has a vote at the table. Um, all of these meetings uh, are open to the public, and they are, they are posted on the Dr. Cog calendar, uh, and most of the time they are actually posted on the individual um, jurisdiction who is hosting that meeting. And of course, what we had always hoped from the beginning is that these transportation forums are still continuing to live on uh, beyond the 20 to 23 TIP process. We anticipate that we'll be using this for future TIP processes, but in addition, we're also using it for, for Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD information um, spreading. In addition to uh, some forums have even utilized the forums for um, their own local communication, um, maybe perhaps such as a adoption of a local uh, community plan. Uh, for the regional share in the 20 to 23 tip, um, received 20% received of the overall funding, again, after those set-asides were taken off the top. And the goal of this share was really to select a limited number of, of regional and very high priority projects. Um, to, to accomplish this, we had to place project eligibility limits on that. Um, the funding requests were limited. Uh, in addition to requiring a minimum match, I believe for that, uh, for that tip, it was 50%. In addition to um, having certain locations that were eligible versus other locations. In the regional share, um, those applications uh, did come back to Dr. Cog's staff where we scored them. However, we did create a panel that was able to review not only the scores, but apply other factors if they wished. And that panel is the one who made those recommendations um, to the Dr. Cog committees and ultimately the board. For the sub-regional share, uh, this comprised uh, the majority of the funding or 80%, but that funding was then further defined um, and targeted to each of the eight individual sub-regions um, through a formula. And the goal was really to implement or continue to implement MetroVision and the regional transportation plan, but also to inject the local values that each subregion may have. Um, as you know, there may be one subregion that has a different set of, of local values and perhaps is at a different development stage than another. So it was important that each subregion had the ability to ask additional questions beyond the standard application. For the subregional share, uh, we really did limit the eligibility rules. Um, in essence, we said, if it was federally eligible, you were able to apply with a couple of, a couple of exceptions. 
for this share. Um, each of the forums were responsible for scoring, reviewing, and making that determination on which projects they would recommend, um, again, back to um, the Dr. Cog committee structure and the board. Uh, tip focus areas was also an, an, an important part of this tip process. Um, the focus areas helped guide investments um, for the projects that were to be submitted. Um, the tip focus areas that were used in the previous tip include a mobility for vulnerable populations, um, system reliability, and of course, safety and security. Um, for this last tip process, the tip focus areas um, were not a project eligibility component meaning a project did not necessarily have to meet one of those three tip focuses to be eligible, though if they did not meet um, any of those or even just one, of course their score would be considered low, considerable lower. Uh, a couple other things I just wanted to mention that were important changes to this previous process or to this process compared to the previous. Um, the application itself, um, was greatly changed and it kind of went from a, a quantitative based on a 100 point scale to a qualitative where we were able to ask the sponsors, why is this project important for your region or the subregion? And of course that scoring system also did change um, using a, a relatively simple high, medium, low score uh, to be able to rank those projects. And of course, another element that was important for the project sponsors is we, are, we also removed the requirement to submit um, pro certain project types, um, i.e. like a roadway capacity or roadway operational. Um, instead, they were able to simply submit any type of project they wish. So as I uh, was saying earlier, uh, we did start the development of uh, this next tip cycle uh, back in April. Uh, the top half of this um, sheet includes the development of the TIP policy document. Um, we've sorted, we've already started this process, and you can see on the left-hand column, it does outline the topics um, that we're going to, uh, that we've already talked with the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee and those ones coming up in the future. Uh, we're looking for uh, eventual board um, discussion and adoption in January of uh, 2022, so early next year. Uh, moving into the bottom half, uh, we can see an outline of uh, both of the call for projects, both the regional share and the sub-regional share. And we're, we're gearing up towards a April of 2023 adoption. Again, this will kind of set us up very nicely for um, starting off in federal fiscal years 24. Um, I think the most important part of this graph is to understand that this is all a work in motion. Um, it can certainly change over time. There's a lot of things that we're continuing to monitor both on the state and the federal level, um, including the greenhouse gas initiatives um, and the federal funding packages. So we may have to move things around as we hear different information, uh, but certainly this is a, a decent draft schedule to start with and we'll continue to work with um, not only the Transportation Advisory Committee to bring items to them to get their feedback, but also we'll be bringing um, items to the board for, for your feedback, uh, hopefully starting next month. Um, so with that, uh, that concludes the presentation I have for this evening. Uh, I'll be happy to take any comments or questions you may have. Any comments and questions from folks um, around our dual tip model? The first comment this evening is from Director Odoricio. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right. I always like to check that. Um, can you go back to the changes of criteria, please? Um, sorry, which slide are you looking for? I think that this one. Um, okay. Uh, so so let, let's summarize again some of the, the, the big changes in criteria uh, compared to last time. So. Um, I'm trying to understand a little bit more of that. And does this only relate to the to the the shared um, the shared pot, or is it relate to the, does it trickle down into the sub areas as well? Uh, both the, the regional and the sub regional share uh, shared a similar application um, with the questions that we asked. Um, if you look at a pre dual model application, uh, we are asking. Um, app, we were asking questions that really dove into a numerical outcome. So 
um, you know, what is the condition of your roadway? Um, you know, what is the condition of X? And, and how does, how does Y um, look at different aspects of your project? With the dual model and the different questions that we're asking, um, we were, we're trying to get at the reasons behind why this project is important for the region or your subregion. Um, how does it affect maybe your, your neighbors? Um, what else can it do to um, complement the existing roadway network or active transportation network? Direct, Director Odorizio, let me just try to make sure I understand your question and then make sure Director Cottrell understands your question so you're all talking about the same thing. So. What we're talking about tonight is really just describing what we did last time and how this process works. And so I'm trying to understand, are you asking how that compares to what we used to do before the last tip cycle? Or are you asking what we're going to do next time compared to the last time? I, I think that's a fair uh, clarification. Is um, When we talk about the new selection process, we're not talking about, we're talking about the one that we just completed or the one that we're about to, to embark on. Correct. We're talking about the 20 to 23 cycle, the one that we had just completed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Ashley. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so does that does that answer your question? Yeah, I do. I do recall that because I remember us making um, making uh, some of those changes, and and I just wanted to make sure before we start changing it again because I thought we were doing pretty good with this um, with what we did, and I just wanted to make sure this is. How do we did from before to now? And we're not talking about yet now to the future. Thank you, that's correct. Right. Thank you very much. So I, re I remember some of this and I'm like, wait, I thought that's where we moved it to. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you, Director Odori. So just, there's a lot of new folks um, and making sure everybody's on the same page going forward is important that we all understand what the process is. So I think that's the intent of this informational item. Director Teal. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I wanted my comments on this one to be focused on a little bit what we heard from Commissioner Rodriguez, so kind of pick up there. In, in terms of, I think the real perception of value of this dual model system in, in this last tip. Um, you know, Madam Chair, I'm sure you recall when we first started on the board um, almost seven years ago, maybe seven years ago, how, you know, there, there there was a lot of discussion going into that tip cycle that we were coming out of when you and I and, and Director Dyack and a few others came on board um, into that, that interim tip cycle in our time on the board uh, about, um, 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 I'm totally spacing, um, but equity, uh, you know, regional equity of the process and how there really was this very real perception for many communities, uh, the smaller communities, as well as the uh, kind of the medium-sized communities, like what I was representing out of Castle Rock at the time, uh, that you know uh, there, there was this domination of tip projects uh, for for Denver, Boulder, and Aurora. We could talk in circles for hours on the validity of uh, those uh, of the logic there, but the reality was that was a very real perception. And that's what really drove this dual model um, in this last tip cycle. And um, I feel like by having this dual model in this last tip cycle, that went away. And it allowed us to have a funding basis for the region that really was spread throughout the region, really did um, you know, focus on, yeah, we got some uh, very good significant um, uh, projects done at the regional level, but we were able to sort of spread the peanut butter ourselves to quote one of my least enjoyed phrases um, that we heard used a lot um, by having that control at the sub-regional level. So um, I, I appreciate uh, Todd bringing this forward uh, as a briefing item, because I'm sure we know that we do have uh, members of the board that I uh, don't have quite the longevity that uh, Madam Chair, you and I, and a couple of other members of the board do. And um, it, it allowed um, us to kind of review where we were now, because I know when I first came on board the board um, for that very first tip cycle, we were coming in at the end and actually we were going to kind of the leftover uh, funds 
and I was completely lost. Um, I, I hope I'm not completely lost anymore. Uh, but the bottom line is I do see a lot of value in our dual system. Um, I'm rather proud um, knowing that I played um, like other members of the board when that decision was made to adopt the dual cycle. I'm very proud of my small part being played in that. And um, I, for one, advocate us to um, continue moving forward with it. I think it's a system that works. And, um, you know, I think uh, compared to the lack of emotion, the lack of hard feelings that we have seen before for this tip cycle, that tells me this is the optimal route for collaboration as a region. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Teal. Director Sandgren. Thank you, Director um, and Chair. Uh, I, I just want to echo exactly what we just heard. The collaboration from the dual process was um, incredible, really. It was something that you know, I heard the horror stories of the previous cycle. So luckily I didn't experience that. And my experience with the TIP process was really just one of collaboration. It brought our whole region together. Um, there was a lot of celebration on projects that were getting funded that were never um, an option before. And so I just wanna thank staff again for their work and um, getting all the paperwork and all of us really organized and um, the process itself because it really was an, an incredible process and I'm looking forward to being a part of the next one. Thank you very much, Director Pfeiffer. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I wanna again echo as well my peers here who have been here as long as uh, I have, uh, I, I think it's been longer, it feels like uh, more to eight years. But you know, one thing I would say, I remember the first time I went to my first uh, board meeting and it was, um, we were talking about tip and money and you all have heard me say this where uh, civility was not existent in our boardroom. It was more of a, I always called it the gladiator arena. And uh, I think when you talk about defining equity, uh, I remember a, a former um, a gentleman who was on our board uh, from Denver, you know, Anthony, uh, who challenged me with a question of how do you define equity when you look at major cities, small cities, rural cities, urban cities, suburbs, and how do you define that? And I think we've really hit it right on the head with this process and our, our way we handle uh, this. And I just want to celebrate um, those successes over the last eight years of getting where we are today to where we were when I first started. If we continued the way we were when I first started, I would probably still not, I wouldn't be here. They're absolutely there. I can't go through more of that name, that brain numbing exercise. So uh, kudos to everyone involved. Thank you, Director Pfeiffer. Next comment um, is from Director Coombs. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that as well from Aurora, even as perhaps folks that were dominant and got what we needed from the previous process that from our members of the regional forums, as well as from our staff, um, I've had really positive feedback as well. So I think it's great that it works better for everyone doing it this way. Thank you, Director Coombs. Any other comments on the dual tip model this evening? Um, Director Mauer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say that I was just checking in with our Public Works Director going and looking at the schedule and questioning, wait a minute, what projects do we have? And because I was like, wow, I'm, I'm not, it's just not coming to mind. Did, was there something new? Because we haven't had really any meetings to discuss it in a while. And he, go, and he relayed to me, Tammy, we, our projects are already set up now from before the previous process last year. And so, you know, it's just like, that is so nice for our uh, area, area, you know, Arapahoe County, that we know where we're going as, as an entire county. So yeah, it, this process works super well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Director Pastor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe I certainly don't want to cut off uh, conversation or comments from board members, but maybe if if the comments are dwindling down, maybe just I, to. I called you last when everyone was done talking. Thank I apologize. You very much. I appreciate that. Just maybe closing <laughs> that out a little bit. Um, you know, I, I think as staff, we certainly appreciate the positive feedback from the board members. 
uh, and our and our and our member agency staff about how they how good they felt about the last tip cycle. I think it, from our perspective, it worked worked very well. Also, um, and that's reflected. If if you, if many of you recall, we did we did a whole white paper analysis of the last um, tip process after it was completed, um, and I think just to give you some hints, we we're certainly not proposing any wholesale changes to the overall tip process, but every tip cycle gives us an opportunity to sort of rethink and, and learn lessons from the previous cycle. And that's really what this is focused on is, is refinements to the process to make it even better, right? To, to address some issues that came up in, in, in that process that, that we all learned from, we got good, positive, constructive feedback uh, from uh, our member agencies and partner agencies about the process that you know we can we can address and work through in this policy development. We just wanted everyone to have sort of a common understanding of what the overall process was for the last tip cycle. All of that really will carry forward. It's really about refinement, and it's also an acknowledgement of the fact that just earlier this year you all adopted um, a brand new regional transportation plan for the region, and and we want to make sure that our next tip cycle reflects that and and uh, carries carries on um, that work uh, through our investment decisions to this next tip cycle. So no big wholesale changes in the process, just addressing lessons learned and refining the process to make it even better. So thank you. Thank you, Director Papsdorf. That was a great note to end on and we all look forward to the next steps and seeing what will come. Thank you so much. And so that will take us to our next um, item, which is our committee reports. And so we'll start off with a report from the stack. Uh, I mentioned uh, the year 3B funding earlier in my report of the chair, but I would wanna mention that we also had a great update on the National uh, Highway Freight Program. And so the Freight Advisory Committee chair actually told us they uh, recommended all of the improvements, which are super important to getting goods to all of our stores and homes. And um, it's, it's critically important to commerce in our state. So it was great to see that and the, and the network that's getting improved there. And then um, we also talked a bit about um, greenhouse gas rulemaking and uh, whether we were ready to move the rule forward uh, whether we wanted to make a recommendation to the Transportation Commission to move the greenhouse gas rule forward on uh, July 15th or not. And the stack, um, this was at a special meeting, voted to recommend delaying uh, one month because we haven't seen what the proposed rule is, haven't had uh, enough information to understand if we're ready to move to rulemaking and wanted more time to be able to weigh in. But the Transportation Commission ultimately uh, moved forward with it in any case as well. So that is my report. Next is the report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The Metro Mayors have not met since our last meeting, so we do not have a report tonight. Thank you. Next is the report from the Metro Area County Commissioners. Director Baker, you're on mute. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we met in June and we heard from Bev Marquez, the CEO, of Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners, along with uh, Cherry Skelding, Vice President of Clinical Operations for the Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners. We also heard from John Kellner, District Attorney for the 18th Judicial District. The Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners spoke on the um, uh, proposed funding from each one of the counties in the Metro Area County Commissioners. And um, uh, District Attorney Kellner talked about all of the efforts that they have uh, to work on human trafficking. Douglas County's uh, Deputy County Manager, Barbara Drake and uh, County Commissioner Abe Layden um, expressed their support towards the uh, 988, uh, funding the 988 subcommittee. And we're also um, evaluating some logos for MAC <laughs> to be used on communications with uh, that we will be having a July in-person meeting and uh, that'll be uh, on Friday. And I wanna say thank you to Executive Director uh, Doug Rex. Uh, we are going to be holding that meeting in person uh, in the Aspen Birch Conference Room at the Denver Regional Council of Governments building. So that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Baker. And next we have the report from the Advisory Committee on Aging. 
Hi everyone. Um, the, the Advisory Committee on Aging reviewed and approved proposals on our voucher program for transportation and homemaker services, as well as personal care services that were forwarded uh, to the uh, to FNB committee and they voted on those uh, this evening, also fall prevention. Rich gave us a status report on the legislative bills that were related to aging and how they all turned out, which were um, everything that we supported um, passed in one way or another. So that was really good news. We also had a, a project visibility training. We have been doing this training for a number of years, um, but we modified it and proved it, I think. Uh, the goal of, this is the training, of the training is to help those that serve LGBTQ plus older adults um, have a better understanding of the unique needs that they have, the, the challenges that they have now uh, and, uh, and endured over time, and then have an appreciation for the incredible re resiliency of this community. Uh, this training provides LGBT history, which I think is really important to understand when you're talking about, you know, elders who are in their 80s and 90s and what they went through. Um, uh, kind of talks about the terminology um, uh, of LGBT community and then teaches skills to work with LGBT elders um, uh, in a more uh, sensitive and culturally appropriate way. Thank you, Director Warren. And that takes us to our um, Regional Air Quality Council report from our Executive Director, Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the RAC did not have a July meeting, so I have no update. Great, next we have a report from E470. I think we're gonna hear from Director Sandgren tonight. You are, thank you. Um, so we had a couple of things. We um, approved dedication of about three acres um, to Arapahoe County and then an additional 22 acres um, as a public auction for land that we weren't using. And then we approved a feasibility study to review acceleration of the construction of the future 48th Avenue interchange. Um, we had a discussion and approval um, about co our collections contracts. And then the um, exciting thing was we actually celebrated 30 years of E470 um, this, this month uh, with a big party in the parking lot of the headquarters. That's my report. Thank you. Next, we have a report from CDOT from Director Rebecca White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, well, I was intending to give a report out on the uh, mudslides we've been facing in Glenwood Canyon and, and share some of our um, Transportation Commission new appointments. Um, however, I feel like given tonight's uh, discussion by the chair, I, I need to try to use my time tonight to respond a bit. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been sitting here tonight listening to my family in the other room eat dinner and, and thinking that I've generally really enjoy these Dr. Cog meetings because it's just an opportunity to sit down um, even though it's time away from family, I know that we're all here in the spirit of moving our region forward. Um, and I very much appreciate that and, and interpret um, tonight's remarks very much in that spirit. Um, that's, that's why I do this work. And, um, you know, CDOT, of course, has to look statewide. So I do want to offer then that if there are specific questions sort of based on some of what was discussed tonight, I am available nearly any time, day or night. Um, but I did wanna just share a, a couple things in response. So you just know um, some of the process we've gone through and the decisions we've made. Um, so specific to the project decisions uh, that uh, the commission voted on last week, uh, we did move forward pretty quickly. That has been the commission's um, uh, direction to do that when we received stimulus dollars that are meant to get Colorado back on its feet after the pandemic. And because we spent about 18 months uh, developing a project list through a very lengthy statewide process, we have an agreed upon list of projects to move forward on. So let me tell you what we funded. Um, we have 50 million we're spending on the Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel to do some critical repairs uh, as we are, are losing some key parts of that structure, including the generators, the water quality system, the lining, we're gonna have to replace the lights soon. Uh, so that structure is showing its age, and you've probably seen some reports in the Denver Post on that. We are spending $20 million to fix the noise walls along I-70 in the metro area. Those are those wooden walls you see regularly um, hanging down on the ground because they fall over when the wind is pretty much anything over 30 miles per hour. 
We are spending $12.5 million to get a mobility hub built at I-25 and State Highway 7 because we're working very hard to try to encourage a different traffic pattern on I-25 and, and help people access busting and other transit. So we're building a network of mobility hubs. Along that lines, we allocated $2 million uh, to the bus staying service on the Floyd Hill uh, because uh, we'll be about in about five years of construction up there and want to provide a transit option. So we're gonna run a Pegasus service. We allocated two and a half million to better study uh, the safety issues we're seeing on CDOT facilities in the Denver metro area. Uh, we uh, have a lot of the roads that see a lot of the accidents we've seen for peds and bikes, bicyclists, including Colorado and Colfax and Federal and Santa Fe. We're as worried about that problem as you are and want to take a broader look at that. And then we are buying a Bustang bus for $625,000. So specific to the projects um, that are still on the list, for Floyd Hill, we've already allocated 135 million. This is about a $400 million project. We are moving forward with phase zero and phase one on that. That's the shovel ready part of that. The rest of the project is not ready. The final EA is gonna go out here in a couple of weeks. We've got to complete that and get a contractor on board. On I-270, that's a project that's slated for funding with year four of the money we received, but it's received $6 million so far to advance the study on that so that we are ready um, and can go to construction as soon as we get the rest of the dollars in. Again, that is a project that is not ready right now. If we allocated the full amount to that, it would sit in the bank for a year and not get out into the economy. And then the I-70 West bridges in the metro area that the um, Chair mentioned we've already allocated 50 million to those. We are fixing Harlan and Ward and have found some bridge enterprise money for 32nd. So that is where we are at. Uh, we will receive, um, thanks to Senate Bill 260, another about 450 million in the last year of Senate Bill 267 in the coming year. Um, and that will allow us to finish those high priority projects in the Denver metro area. Uh, so again, I am open to any discussions with individual members or at a future meeting on those projects. On the um, work we are doing on the greenhouse gas rule, that also is a direct mandate from Senate Bill 260. We've been working for about seven months on that concept, though, um, with a lot of um, participation from the Dr. Cog staff. It is a difficult um, new policy. This is one of the first states in the entire nation to be looking at greenhouse gases in this way. Uh, it's complicated, and um, I think I, I'm looking forward to next month's discussion about that. So thank you for the uh, liberty to just say a few things tonight and uh, look forward to more conversation about these topics. Thanks. Thank you, Director White. And next is a report on Fast Tracks. Thank you, Chair and fellow board members, Bill Van Meter, RTD. Just one item to inform you about as the next scheduled meeting for the RTD Fast Tracks Committee is next month. They did not hold one last month, but the board did consider in, earlier this month authorizing staff to proceed with a procurement for the Northwest Rail Peak Service Plan. I've briefed this body a couple of times in the past months about RTD's intent to move forward with a planning and environmental linkages type study in coordination and concert with the Colorado Department of Transportation, the Southwest Chief Front Range Passenger Rail Commission and its successor, the district, presumably next year. So we asked our board of directors authorization to proceed with that plan for the Northwest Rail Peak Service um, at an estimated cost of about $12 million. That was higher than our board felt comfortable with. And they asked us to make, to go back, us being staffed, to go back and return to the board with a revised recommendation at a lower cost on August 10th that still assures the key components and the key questions and risk factors and interests of local jurisdictions are all addressed. 
So we have been working with representatives from local jurisdictions, from CDOT, and from Dr. Cog, staff representatives, um, to look at opportunities to trim scope, bring that cost back, make sure that we have a robust study with robust public engagement, and have the key risk factors and questions from local jurisdictions as well as RTD board members and stakeholders answered in a two-year study that we believe we can um, still move forward with and kick off by early next year. So stay tuned, August 10th, we'll be bringing a re revised proposal back to our board of directors. Thank you. And don't worry, Ariane, I see you. I'm going to catch you on other matters by members. And so just to point out, there's an informational item in the back of your packet as attachment G, the Transportation Improvement Program Administrative Modifications. If you have questions on those informational briefings, please do reach out to Dr. Cog's staff. The next meeting is August 18th, 2021, and that takes us to other matters by members. Director Brockett. Thanks, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to just real briefly say, um, Director White, I appreciated um, you pivoting and giving us that uh, additional information. Uh, very interesting to hear what um, CDOT is up to, and maybe if we can get a, a report on on that, um, you know, some of those issues that Ashley, the Director Stolzman, raised. Be interested to interesting to know more about that. And then I know you all have um, been digging really deeply into uncharted territory on the greenhouse gas rulemaking area, so. Again, looking forward to learning more about that for our meeting next month and having a good discussion about it. Thank you, Director Brockett. Any other matters by members? All right, seeing none, thank you so much. It's 8.06 and we're adjourned. Have a great night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.